worship him, Lord. Worship him, church. Worship the Lord. He's done great things in your life. I'm thankful for what he's already done, and I'm thankful for what he's going to do. Amen? Hallelujah. He has set the captives free. He's broke the bondage. My God holds the key to death, hell, and the grave. And I'm thankful that he goes before me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's worship the Lord right now. Can you worship him all across this place? Lord, we thank you, God. We thank you for what you're doing in this house. Lord, we thank you for what you've already done. God, we love you. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. Hallelujah. The Lord deserves a great hand clap of praise right now. Amen, amen. We love you, Jesus. I thank you for what I feel in the house this morning. Amen, amen, amen. We have many needs in this church. And... Uh, you've been online, you see several needs that have been posted, and uh, we want to go before the Lord in prayer. Before I do that, I want to just thank you as a church for all of your prayers over the last several weeks and months. They meant, they have meant so much to so many people, and uh, I have a card here that uh, Sina wants me to read to the church. It's just beautiful, and it says, with special thanks to all of you. To know you is to know people who are kind, considerate, and thoughtful. To know you is to be grateful for the special things that you do. For everything you've done, for being the special people that you are, thank you so much. And then she wrote, words cannot express the appreciation I feel for all of you and what you have done from the food that has been shared to the text, the emails, and above all, the prayers that have been said. I am blessed. Thank you, Sina. So I just want to thank you, church, for reaching out with your time, with your prayers. We are a praying church, but we don't stop now. Sina, we're still with you. We're still believing. We're still there beside you, walking with you. It's just such a beautiful card and great testimony to this church. And I just want to thank you again. And um, we have many needs, as many of you have, have been keeping up also on Facebook for uh, Glenn Worley. He is in need of a touch of God. He's in need of a miracle today. And I know a God that's still a miracle working God. And we can touch the throne of heaven for Glenn Worley. And Betty Worley as well, I want to remember her. Sister Cindy Falk is sick. We want to remember her today. Tammy Simmons and Peggy Jenkins. Josh Bertrand's mother is in the hospital and needs a touch of God. AC and Bobby Smith, we want to continue to remember them today. We have many needs, and I know there are others. If you have a need, make it known by the lifting of your hand. I'm going to open up this altar. I've got a prayer team here that's ready. If you have a need and you want prayer today, I'm going to invite you to the front. I'm going to ask the pastoral team and the prayer team to make their way down. And by faith, can you just lift your hands right now and let's just touch the throne of God. This is how we fight our battles, church, right now. In the name of Jesus, every need, God, every need, Lord. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. Do you believe that today, church? This is how I fight my battles. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you.
just want to give a quick testimony. Now, Bobby, I want you to, you just told me while I go before church that AC has had all kinds of problems. He went to the doctor and he's cancer free now, right? Wow. Now that is a prayer answering God. He still has a few, a few areas that he's got to go through, but the fact that there's no cancer in his body is a praise report. It's a praise report. And how we fight that battle is right down here by faith. By faith in Jesus' name. Praise God. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm thankful for what I feel in the Holy Ghost. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. It is so good to see all of you here today. And if you're a guest worshiping with us today, we are so thankful that you are here. You have so many places to choose, and, and we're just glad that you chose to worship with you. If you're online watching today, Thank you, thank you. If you are a member of this church, we miss you. We certainly understand, and we miss you and can't wait to see you back. God bless you. You may be seated. We have some announcements that we must make, and I don't want to take too long, but we have some great things going on. It is the holiday season. I see a lot of people already decorating for Christmas, my Lord. My Lord, my Lord, it's not Thanksgiving yet. But I see Christmas trees all over Facebook. What is happening around here? I think everybody's just excited about Christmas, amen? They're ready to get through and get through this year and move on. Amen, amen. Well, as we uh, have stated several weeks now, uh, this Wednesday there will be no midweeks uh, online service. Okay, we want you to... Spend some time with your family and take that opportunity. However, if you are part of CR or want to be a part of CR, we want you to know that CR will still meet Wednesday. They will always meet every Wednesday, even if the services are online. They will meet up, up top or here in the sanctuary at 7 p.m. on Wednesday. So we don't want there to be any confusions there. Now. If you are a volunteer, I've got some exciting, exciting news for you. Now, how many of you volunteer here at TLC? Raise your hand. Yes, if you are a volunteer. Now, how many of you want to volunteer here at TLC? Come on now. Come on. It's exciting around here. There's a lot going on. And uh, if you are a volunteer, that means you are a part of the dream team. And on December the 6th, we have a luncheon for you. And it is going to be incredible, great food. We have some special things uh, planned for you uh, during that. And so we want to honor you uh, with this luncheon and thank you. And that's just a small, small token of our appreciation. We There are so many things that you deserve for all your hard work around this campus and what you do. But we do want to honor you with that. We need you to RSVP. Go to Facebook. If you've got an email, please uh, respond to that email. We want you to uh, RSVP so we know how many people and how many children are coming for that luncheon. Amen. How many of you are ready to give to the Lord? Yes. Giving to God. You cannot outgive God. Amen. Ushers, come if you will. And as they come, I'm going to pray over the word, over the word. I'm going to pray over the rest of this service and over this offering. God, we love you. We thank you, God, for what you're doing and what we feel in this service, Lord. We ask you to bless this offering. God, I ask you to break it, Lord, and use it for your kingdom, Lord. We thank you for what you're doing on this campus. And Lord, in this service today, as we move forward, God, I ask the Holy Ghost be poured out, Lord. Let us respond to your word, God. Let us open our hearts, our minds, and our ears. In the name of Jesus, and everybody said, amen, amen. God bless you as you give.
Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on. Can we lift him up right now, church? Can we lift him up all across this place right now? Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we love you. In your own way, why don't you tell him that? Jesus. Jesus, we love you. God, we thank you. We praise you, Lord. We worship you, Father. Such a sweet, sweet presence of the Lord in this place. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Can we give the Lord a hand clap of praise, church, all across this place this morning? Before you are seated, we are going to pray this morning. Before we pray, I want Pastor Daryl to run up here. This young man celebrated his 45th birthday this week. And I think it would be great to give him a card and show him appreciation and love. We love you, Pastor Daryl. We appreciate all that you do around here, my friend. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Love you. Love you. I told him he was halfway to 90. He kind of looked at me mean when I said that. But love you, Pastor Daryl. Love, love you guys. Good to see everybody back in the house of the Lord this morning. Today, I'm going to do my best to give some instruction encouragement and a commission and before we pray over this word I had a, a note from Elder Joe Luca I was texting back and forth with him he's home from the hospital and recovering well and like most people with this been through this COVID thing this post COVID fatigue it's a real deal I've uh, I can go to lunch with somebody and sit at a table and feed my face for two hours and make one stop at the store and get home and feel like I've chopped wood for eight hours. It's like, Lord, I know I'm not the best of shape, but Jesus, help me. It's, it's, mine's getting better. He tell me he's, uh, he's working on that himself. That's, that's where he's at is getting through that fatigue. But he sent me a note and he said, I appreciate the prayers. And it was only the hand of God that brought me back said one evening the doctors had exhausted all their options and there was absolutely nothing else they could do and he said it was at that point just like this song we just sang it was at that point he said God stepped into the room and he said I want to thank the church with all sincerity for their prayers he said if it wasn't for the prayers of the body of Christ I wouldn't be here so we want to pray for him. And let me tell you, Brother Glenn Worley needs this kind of touch from God. He needs God to step into the room where he's at this morning. He needs a miracle. So as we pray for this word, can we pray for Brother Worley this morning? Father, right now, Jesus, in the matchless name of Jesus Christ, by the authority of the Word of God, we pray the prayer of faith this morning, agreeing together, God, right now, that you would touch Brother Glenn Worley right where he's at, God, right now, touch his body, touch his heart, touch his lungs, touch his mind. We're asking you, God, to do a miraculous work right now, Father. Touch all those recovering from COVID. Do a mighty, mighty work in their bodies. And I pray right now, God, that you would open every heart, every mind, and every soul right now. Let our hearts receive your word. Let our ears, God, hear your word this morning. Prepare every heart, mind, and soul. In the matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Could everybody say, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated this morning. I'm going to do my best for the next few moments to talk to you on the subject, hand out hope. Hand out hope. I don't know about you guys, but when you look around the world today, there is a need for hope. I saw the incredible influence and persuasion, persuasive power of hope just this week. I said 
in the hospital. Ten to twelve members of a wonderful family. I watched on Monday morning as we sat there together. They were given little to no hope for the future of a loved one. They were going to make some directions and, and decisions for the future of this person that laid in ICU. But we met again on Wednesday morning. And at this point, there was just a sliver of hope from the doctors. And that sliver of hope shifted their direction. It changed their decision. It was a great thing. I was elated for the family. And we're believing and hoping and praying for a miracle and holding on to every shred of hope. But as I conveyed to one of the family members, we're thankful this morning that our hope truly is in God alone. Amen. Church, we are standing at a time when the world and our country are hopeless. I, I think we have to get our brain. I'm going to take the first part of this message and lay a little foundation. We have to understand this country and this world is too far gone. They are, we have passed the markers. We have passed any type of return and reliance upon the systems of this world and the systems of this country. We cannot rely on our economic system. We've seen that this past year. We cannot rely on our judicial system, our voting system, our health care system is overwhelmed time and time again. The past year, both political parties in this country have utterly failed us as United States citizens. And they've definitely failed us as Christians. We're foolish to blame it on any one person. If we consult the Word of God, we can clearly see what is happening around the world and right here in our country. 1 John chapter 2, beginning in verse 17, John wrote, And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. Dear, dear children, the last hour is here. He penned this 2,000 years ago. You have heard that the Antichrist is coming. And have already many such Antichrists have appeared. From this we know this is the last hour has come. If the spirit of the Antichrist was alive and well in full force 2,000 years ago, how much more do you think it is active and working in our world today? I would submit to you this morning there's such a spirit of perversion. The spirit of Antichrist is at work and it has turned the minds of one group of people, one group of humans against another group. I want you to think back for a moment to last Thanksgiving, right at a year ago this week. You were sitting around the table enjoying your turkey and your dressing, and we'll all be doing that in a few days in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. You were talking about the Black Friday deals you were going to get up at some insane hour of the morning and go shopping for. Your Christmas wish list was being discussed, and who was going to go back for seconds or maybe even thirds? Sitting at that table a year ago, if someone would have spoke up and said, hey family, in the next 12 months, we will see multiple states here in the U.S. of A outlaw church. In the next 12 months, we're going to see singing in church outlawed. Our religious freedoms are going to be gone. If they would have said at that Thanksgiving table last year that states would be dictating how many family members can gather in your home at Thanksgiving this year, what would you have said? If somebody would have said at that dinner table, 99% of all businesses in the next year will require that you put a piece of cloth over your face just to walk in their door and transact business. If you'd have said a global pandemic is coming and 
1.3, 1.4 million people are going to die, a quarter of a million, right here in the U.S. of A. What would have been your thought? You would have said, no, that, that, not, not in a year. No, that's, that's kind of extreme. If you think that a government system that is so manipulated by the spirit of Antichrist is going to give up control when this vaccine is ready, my friend, you're being naive. CNBC, November 16th, and I'm quoting an article from a mainline news source. CNBC quoted Dr. Anthony Fauci, quote, But I would recommend people not abandon all public health measures just because you have been vaccinated, end quote. There's already a foundation being laid. The narrative is already begin to begin ingrained in our society. Pastor Ken Gurley shared an incredible little one of his morning devotions this week, and I took it and, and I listened and watched what he said, and I thought, preacher, you're you're kind of out there. And then I did a little research. You're going to be hearing more about this first part of the year. But the goal of the Antichrist government system is total. Control. That's what the book tells us. So if we study biblical prophecy, understand where where are we right now, Pastor? I don't know how many of you ever heard of the World Economic Forum. They meet every year. It's the world's nation national leaders, the world's business leaders. They come together in a ski resort, Duvas, Switzerland. And they meet and they discuss certain things and they really have been overlooked for many years because it seemed like the central theme of their discussions was climate control. People didn't subscribe to that, kind of overlooked that. However, and and everything that I'm talking about, you can go to the worldeconomicforum.org, weforum.org, and I am lifting words off of their website. Not some crazy Facebook page, not some wacko whatever. I'm talking about the World Economic Forum's website, weforum.org. World Economic Forum 2021, the theme that they will gather and discuss in May of 2021 is the Great Reset. They published that in May or June of this year. And I quote from their website, there is an urgent need for global stakeholders to cooperate in a simultaneously managing of the direct consequences of the COVID-19 crisis to improve the state of the world. The World Economic Forum is starting the Great Reset Initiative. The Great Reset is meant to be all-encompassing. Its its partners organization include the biggest players in data collection, telecommunications, weapon manufacturing, finance, pharmaceuticals, biotechnology, and the food industry. Church, this is not some backroom chat, crazy whatever. This is on the website. Their videos are out there. It is an incredible-looking video. Oh, it's phenomenal. They said they're going to have over 400 cities around the world. And their aim is the millennials. And they hope to have millions upon millions join in virtually and hear about the great reset. Justin Trudeau, Prime Minister of Canada, was discussing it publicly just in the last week, week and a half. You know, I preached a series the last week of April and the first week of May called Signs and Seasons. And I told anybody that would listen to me that 9-11 was a step in the direction of fulfilling end-time prophecy. And I said at the end of April, the beginning of May, before this theme was released, I knew what God had put in my heart. And I said, I'm telling you, this pandemic is a a mile, a 10-mile stretch in the direction of lining up world events. That was four weeks before they announced the World Economic Forum's initiative of the Great Reset. We must ensure as a church that we untangle ourselves from the thought that any person in any political party in any government position can help this world out. 
A Baptist preacher and author tried to warn us over 10 years ago. I've referenced this article that he wrote multiple times. Michael Spencer, 2009, he wrote The Coming, Coll uh, the Coming Collapse of the Evangelical Church. And I quote, he said, Evangelicals have identified their movement with the culture war and political conservatism. This will prove a very costly mistake. Evangelicals will increasingly be seen as a threat to cultural progress. Public leaders will consider us bad for America, bad for education, bad for children, and bad for society. The evangelical investment in moral, social, and political issues have depleted our resources. Listen to his last few statements. Being against gay marriage and pro-life will not make up for the fact that the massive majority of evangelicals cannot articulate the gospel with any coherence. In his last statement, we fell for the trap of believing in a cause more than our faith. Eleven years ago. It's okay to voice your opinion in a political setting, to take a stand for God, to take the Bible into politics if you want to. I encourage you to take God into every part of your life, but do not bring a government political person into your hope. We are truly seeing before our very eyes there is salvation in none other except Jesus Christ. I said there's no hope outside of God Almighty as born-again believers, don't fall for the idea that help is coming from a godless, antichrist, man-centered world system. I'm telling you this morning, there is zero hope from any politician, any celebrity, or even any scientist. I'm not anti-political. I vote. I'm not anti-celebrity. I'll take in a good movie now and then. I'm not anti-science. I go to the doctors. I get help. I was calling on them when I had COVID, okay? Now, I'm not anti this stuff. I'm just telling you, don't look for hope in those places. Don't think that they're going to have the answer. Don't think they're going to bring to you what you need, what your family needs, what this world needs. It's not coming from their system. It's not coming from this world. <laughs> Pastor, you're being mighty passionate and indignant about this. You got any Bible for this position? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Second Timothy chapter 2. See, God revealed the great apostle Paul what the end time would look like, and he very anointedly penned these words. You must therefore endure hardships as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please who enlisted him as a soldier we got to understand this morning there is a war for souls of our friends, our families, and our neighbors. In the spirit of the Antichrist, it is absolutely relentless. It will fight any way possible to detract, to deter, to disillusion, and disensuade people until they pass from this life without being born again. Whatever can distract people, that's what the enemy will use we have to offer the loss around us the faith, the hope, and the love of God. Some of you are sitting out there, I can tell by the looks on your faces, you're thinking, Pastor, you, the screen says hand out hope, but whew, you're being mighty negative. <laughs> hope is best seen in the contrast of darkness. we got to understand just how desperate this world is, church. we got to realize that we are the people with the answer. We have the only hope that this world can rely on. Great Charles Spurgeon, he said, hope itself is like a star not to be seen in the sunshine of prosperity and only to be discovered in the night of adversity. That's when hope is seen best. Some of us are recently beginning to see our hope is truly in the Lord alone. You see it, for the church, if we're just being real honest with ourselves, we paid lip service to our hope is in God. Oh, for the last decade or two, I've been right there with you. I can raise my hand. Oh, I hope in God. But I, 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 go, and I, I go on the job, and that's where I hope my paycheck comes from. 
Oh, well, I hope in God, but, but I'm going to cast my vote and I'm going to hope that the, the right political party straightens out this mess over here and gets that right. Oh, I, I hope in God, but I hope the scientists come through and the doctors have a, have a breakthrough. Our liberties, our constitution, our candidates, our jobs, that's really been where we have found the handout of hope. But with all that failing, with all of that crumbling around us, we begin to see a little more clearly now. I often walk around my block. I did it last night, actually, and run into a neighbor, and we actually talked for about 45 minutes. But typically, I walk around my block, and it takes about 20 minutes to make the circle, and I use that time a lot of times to clear my head or I use that time to, to pray. About a week and a half ago, I had been listening to nothing but a constant feed of election tension and COVID outbreaks, doom and gloom. And I, I just walked downstairs. It was getting dark. And I told Bridget, I said, I'm going to take a block, take a, take a walk around the block. And our neighbors down both sides of the street have started decorating for Christmas. And there's lights and candy canes all lit up up and down our street. Pastor Daryl referenced this early. People are just grabbing Christmas and just dragging it closer and closer and closer. Normally, I, I'm, I'm not a big fan. I get a little bit annoyed at people that put up the Christmas lights before Thanksgiving, but flung against the backdrop of 2020. Okay, I, I understand that. I get that. You know, I walked down my driveway. And I was going on this walk, spending a little time with God intentionally. But when I got to the end of my driveway, I looked and I saw all those Christmas lights lit the path both directions, right and left. And those lights represented a baby in a manger. And all of a sudden, I felt just the peace of God settle over me and all the tension. All the stress and the strain of the news cycle just begin to melt away. You see, no matter how hard the culture tries, they can never take Christ out of Christmas. And the hope that was delivered in that stable is the only hope that we can rely on. If you're listening this morning and you're in a tailspin and reeling from world events, I'm here to tell you your only hope is found in Jesus Christ. Starting with the pages of the Old Testament, the prophet Jeremiah relayed a message to the children of God, Jeremiah 29 and 11. He said, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. I want to encourage somebody this morning that God Almighty, He knows what you need. He knows where you are. He knows how stressed out you have been. He knows how worried you have been. He knows how conflicted you have been. And He sent me to tell you this morning that His plans result in your good. The plans He has for your future. Everything is going to be okay. He has a plan for an incredible future. He has a hope. We can hold to this hope because our future does not reside in this world. Regardless of what our tomorrow looks like, our hope is eternal. In the last part of my message this morning, I want to discuss some of the references to hope that the Apostle Paul made to the church in Rome. It's interesting if you study and you look back at the, the backdrop, the situation, the, the church environment, the climate at which Paul was writing to this church. I, I, I read some of this to you. None of you remember this because it was about a year ago that we studied the book of Rome. Romans, I should say. And, and I pulled some of my notes. I looked back at this as I was composing this message and it was just fascinating. And we understand that in the early years, the church in Rome consisted of both Jews and Gentiles. In AD 49, the Emperor Claudius, he expelled all of the Jews out of the city of Rome. Claudius died about five years later. Nero takes the throne and invites the Jews to return. But can you imagine what the mindset was? For five years, the Jews were expelled 
from the city. Can, can you stop and think about the political firestorm this created in this city and even in this region? Can you imagine if you went home this afternoon, you turned on the TV, and you saw an announcement that Governor Greg Abbott has decided that all the Catholics and all the Muslims had to get out of Texas? What if he decided all the Christians had to go? No more Christians in the state of Texas. What, what, what would that do to you? You talk about getting mad. You talk about calling your attorney. You talk about looking around. Wait a minute now. I have somebody to stand up for my rights. This is my land. This is my house. I've paid property taxes to the state of Texas. And now you're telling me because of what I believe, i got to get out? That's what was happening in the city of Rome. During this five-year period, the church continued to grow, but obviously it had great Gentile influence. And so the church became very non-Jewish. And so when the Jews came back, they saw a church, a body of believers that looked a lot different than when they left. I'm talking this church at this point was 15, 20 years old. Very established, very set. And now there was two different mindsets. There was two different ways of thinking. There was the mask people and the non-mask people. There was the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. Oh, come on, I'm getting close to home now, ain't I? There was the red team and there was the blue team in one church. If you think Republicans and the Democrats fight, you ought to see arguments between Jews and Gentiles. Oh, yeah. Paul finds himself in the middle trying to minister to two groups within the church. It was most likely a political fight. They were arguing about religious practices. There was quarreling about economic and traditional issues of the day. Paul was trying to minister to this body of believers that was very divided in a very chaotic time. Having gone through that, it was about eight years later that he penned the words that we read earlier he had gained enough experience and enough insight and that's when he wrote the words to Timothy he said he therefore you must endure hardships as a good soldier of Jesus Christ and no one engaged in warfare entangles himself in the affairs of this life he, I bet he was telling Timothy listen I know what it's like to see a bunch of people fight and argue and bicker over things of this world over the systems and over the governments and over the traditions and over economics and over politics I saw what that did to the church in Rome and I'm trying to tell you it's been eight years but Timothy listen to me Get yourself unentangled from that mess. Get your mind out of that mess. Get your hope away from that because our hope only lies in Jesus. We'd be wise to learn from the Apostle Paul's instruction and direction in this time of civil and church unrest and hand out the same hope that he did to our world around us. It was in the middle of this chaotic time the church in Rome battling over politics, economics, traditions that Paul reminded them, Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 3. He says, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they can help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment. For we know how dearly God loves us because he's given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with love. I believe the Holy Ghost would encourage somebody this morning that the trials we faced this year has helped us develop some endurance. And our endurance that we've developed through the craziness that has been 2020 has developed within us some godly character. And that character leads to a hope of salvation that will never disappoint. I realize the news focuses only on doom and gloom of the day. and They think that bad news is the best news, but I'm trying to tell somebody this morning that hope that God promised us will never disappoint us. So let this trial that you're walking through right now, let it build the character that God wants it to build in your life. A little bit later, Romans chapter 8, he says... He relates to their pain in verse 23. He says, And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a, as a foretaste of future glory. 
For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope. For the day God will give us for our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us, were given this hope when we were saved. I would remind us this morning, tell the world around us that as a born-again believer, yes, we long to be with God Almighty. We, we long to be released from the sin and the suffering that is around us, and we wait as God's children, for our full rights. It may seem dark right now. You may be surrounded with sounds of suffering and pain, but you need to understand the battle you are going through and allow that Holy Spirit to well up within you and to groan for that hope of that future glory. You see, I, I believe God is saying, if my children will look around and realize this world, it's not your home. This world is not your answer. This world is never the place where I intended you to stay. Get hungry for me. Get desiring for heaven. Get hungry for heaven this morning. The hope of God is the only thing the church should be handing out. As he continues in his letter, he does not instruct them to talk bad about Claudius. He does not instruct them to praise Nero for bringing the Jews back. The political climate had impacted the church and it changed the church culture. It was the point the saints needed to focus on handing out hope. In chapter 12 of Romans, he gives them a very clear, very practical and tangible way of handing out hope. Romans 12, beginning in verse 11, he says, Never be lazy, but work hard. Serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying when God's people are in need. Be ready to help them and be eager to practice hospitality. Yeah, in the middle of trouble, work hard. In the middle of trials, be patient. In the middle of all the chaos, just keep praying. It's Paul's closing words to the church. He admonishes the stronger, more mature saints to hand out hope, to help the rest of the church, to strive for peace with one another. Romans 15. Beginning in verse 1, he says, We who are strong must be considerate of those who are sensitive about things like this. We must not just please ourselves, but we should help others to do what is right and build them up in the Lord. For even Christ did not leave, live to please himself. As the scriptures say, the, insult, the insults of those who insult you, O God, have fallen on me. Such things were written in the scripture long ago to teach us. And the scriptures give us hope and encouragement as we patiently wait for God's promises to be fulfilled. We've got to determine in our hearts, in our minds, in our souls today that nothing coming upon this world, politically, economically, socially, we will not be divided. If my brother or my sister wants to get vaccinated, great. If they want to wear a mask, fine. If they want a distance, okay. If they're going to stay home a little bit, that's okay. I'm going to love them. I'm going to love the Lord. We're going to come together. We're going to be in one heart, one mind, in one accord. We are going to come together in this last hour, and we are going to hand out hope to the world around us. Those of us that have lived for God for 10, 15, 20 years, we have an obligation to the younger in the Lord to strive for peace and to build them up. Encourage. That's your job. If you're here today and you say, well, I've had the Holy Ghost for 10 years. I've had the Holy Ghost for 20 years. You've got more of an obligation to look around and say, where are those that have been living for God for two years, for four years, for five or six years? Well, hey, let me build you up. Hey, let me encourage you. Yeah, it's dark around us. Yeah, it looks doomy and gloomy. Listen, we're going to make it. Yeah, you may go this direction, but I, I've still got a hold on. You may look this way. You may make that decision, but you're my brother. You're my sister. I'm going to hold on. In the middle of all the chaos, we are going to make it. There's a hope, and I'm going to hand out hope. I'm going to hand out encouragement as we patiently wait. You see, all of this stuff I've talked about at the beginning of my message, none of it should take us by surprise because God told us about every bit of it. He said, this is what's coming. 
There is, there is going to be a one world leader. There is going to be one world government. There's going to be a one world religion. There's going to be a one world current. This is, and so we begin to read these things in the news and we begin to see this. And the rest of the world, well, they, they may not realize what's coming. They may think it's the best thing since sliced bread. Great. Oh, if, if you dig in the rest of this stuff, oh, they'll tell you. You won't have any property. You won't have any assets, government alone at all. And it's all going to be one great, great social communist happy family. And that worked out so well for so many countries. The world is tearing itself apart, church. Political parties are self-imploding them. In fighting on both sides of the aisle, the health care system is overwhelmed. The country's economic status is uncertain at best. Hear me this morning. This is the time for the church to stand on the Word of God. Amen. Listen to me this morning. This is the time. This is our season to boldly lovingly and kindly share the Word of God. This is our hour. This is our hour. This is your hour. This is my hour to share the hope that you have found in Jesus Christ. Let Peter's words soak in in this final scripture of my message this morning. 1 Peter chapter 3. Beginning in verse 14, he said, But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. In this last portion, if you don't hear anything else I say this morning, hear this last portion that Peter said. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do it with gentleness and respect. Church, as this world grows darker, your hope, like a star, will become more evident. We need to be ready today. If you are not ready, go home, begin to study, begin to read, be ready to give an account for the hope that is in you. Understand that you need to be able to, I didn't say you need to be a Bible scholar, I didn't say you need to be able to, to, to quote this book backwards and forwards, but you need to be able to explain to somebody when they say this world is falling apart, everything looks dark, everything is going wrong, what in the world, how do you have such peace? How do you have such joy? What is this that is radiating from you? You need to be able to explain. Let me tell you what the Apostle Peter said in Acts chapter 2. Let me tell you how to be born again of water and spirit. Let me tell you about the joy that comes from the Holy Ghost. Let's everybody stand. Come on back, true worship. I honestly believe, church, with everything that is within me, that we are in the final season of the end times. That the events that will unfold in the coming months will have people running to you and running to apostolic churches across this nation, spirit-filled churches. I believe they will be beating down the doors. I'll be, they'll believe, I believe they will be clamoring. I believe they'll be asking. I believe they will be in tears. I'm going to be real honest with you. I do not see in the next two months, I don't see how this country gets through the next eight weeks without massive bloodshed in our streets. I have analyzed it. I have thought about it. The one and only way that I, I think it's possible is if Donald J. Trump, if he loses this thing, if he gets up and says, listen, I lost it and, and I lost it and it was fair and it was right and, and, and let's just, he ain't going to do that. It's not him. It's not his style. He may not lose it. He may get it overturned in the courts. But I have thought about this thing in both directions. I do not see at the extreme that our country is in, at the division our country is in. Church, I don't understand, but what we saw over the last six, eight months of the burning of the buildings and all, I believe that's going to be a drop in the bucket of what may come on this country in the next six to eight weeks. And when that happens, 
or any variation of it. If it don't happen in the next couple of months, it'll probably happen in the next couple of years. People are going to look for hope. People are going to say, my goodness, every time I turn on the news, there's nothing but bloodshed and fires and burning and disaster and craziness and, and the jobs market is, is shot and the economy is taken and my 401k is worthless. What do I do? Where do I go? And we need to remember the words of the Apostle Peter. Be ready to give an explanation for the hope that they find in you. How do you have such peace? How are you able to walk through this? How are you able to survive? How are you able not to go out of your mind? What in the world is going on? When that happens, hear your pastor right now. When they come knocking on your door, when they come grabbing you by the collar, do not give them your opinion. Do not give them your advice. Do not give them what your thought is on the matter. Open up the Word of God and say, let me tell you. Let me show you what's coming to this world. Let me show you what God has said is coming this way. Oh, church, we got a hope. I said, we've got a hope, and that's what we need to hand out. We've got a hope in this Word. We've got a hope in the Spirit. we got a hope in God Almighty, and that's what we have to hand out. This hope is our weapon in the coming war. I said, this hope is how we fight our battles. This hope is how we overcome. It's this hope. It's not my opinion. It's not my preaching. It's not my performance. It's not what I'm doing. It's the hope that's found in the Word of God. It's the hope that's found in Jesus Christ. If you're fighting fear today, I want you to step out from where you're at and make your way to the front of this church. If you're battling bitterness today, there's some hope you can come and you can receive. Let me hand you out some hope. Let me invite you to walk, to step out in the aisle as they begin to sing right now. I want to invite you to come and let God Almighty hand you some hope. Oh, come on, if you're torn up inside and you're stressed out. This is how I fight my Found 
just cannot get away. The thought, the understanding. Let me tell you something. Understand what I'm what I'm saying. In these last weeks and months, ever how we have long we have left, I believe it's measured in months, whether it's 4, 24, or 44. If I ever stop preaching out of this book, if I ever change the message that you must be born again of water and of spirit, repenting of your sins, being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost to get to heaven, then find another preacher, find another church that preaches that, and get to it as fast as you can. God help me, I will always preach that until I draw my last breath on this earth. But the word tells us that in this end time, there will be a great falling away. At the same time, there will be a great harvest. And when they come knocking on your door, when they come grabbing you by the shirt tail, don't tell them about Chris Copeland. Oh, don't tell them about True Life Church. No, 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 no. Tell them about Jesus Christ. Open up the Word of God and say, let me tell you what the Word of God says. It ain't my preacher. It ain't my church. It's what the Word says is going to get you out of here. It's what God Almighty says is going to get you out of here. And as long as this church is preaching the truth, then you can bring them here. But they need the Word of God. They don't need a preacher. They don't need a community. They don't need a group. They don't need a social event. They need the Word of God. They need a hope that only comes on the Holy Ghost. They need a hope that only comes through the blood of Jesus. They need a hope that only comes by being buried in the water. I said, because we're going to be surrounded. And we got to understand it may look 